Hello, everyone. How is it going? Uh, today we have with us Debbie Miller, President Social Hospitality. Hey, Debbie, how are you? Hi, I'm good. Thanks. How about yourself? Doing well, doing well. Well, thank you so much, Debbie, you know, for taking our time, uh, you know, on a Friday and, you know, doing this with us. Really excited to have you. My pleasure. I'm excited to chat. Perfect. Well, Debbie, uh, you know, uh, before, uh, you know, I actually start discussing social content with you, uh, you know, it would be great if you could introduce yourself and your company for our viewers. Sure. Yeah. My name is Debbie Miller and I've been running my company, Social Hospitality, for about four and a half years now full time. And then prior to that, I was with another marketing agency, kind of building my own brand on the side. So I've been doing digital marketing now for about 12 years. I started at a nonprofit for a few years and then I worked again for that other agency for six and now for a little over four on my own. I focus primarily on organic social media, email campaigns, co content development. So that includes website copy, blog posts, copy for emails, articles, all that kind of stuff. And that's our primary focus. Um, I work with a variety of industries now. I worked primarily in the hospitality industry previously in my career, which is how the, the name hospitality or social hospitality evolved event at the beginning. But now I work with a variety of different brands, both in the B2B and B2C space to help them tell their story online and hopefully get lots of lots of new clients and customers. <laughs> right. Well, you know, that also explains your journey. But, you know, I mean, from being a graduate in English to starting your own agency, but still, you know, I mean, how, how did that happen? Yeah, I say I always say it was a happy accident about how it happened. So I happened to get an internship at UC Irvine where I was going to college. And I at the time, I didn't know I wanted to go into marketing at all. It was a happy accident that happened. They happened to place me in a marketing internship at that nonprofit that I mentioned previously. And I got hired there when I graduated. So that's kind of how that happened. It wasn't something I really planned. And the timing also was was very fortuitous because I graduated in 2008, which is right on the dawn of social media for businesses. So Facebook had come out a few years prior, but had only been available for college students. And then it started evolving into being available for businesses as well. It was great because right when I graduated and got into marketing, I was able to meet with other people who had been in business for a longer period of time, but they were also brand new to the world of social media marketing. It was brand right. new for everybody. So really even the playing field at the time, which I really enjoyed being a part of and getting to meet and learn from other people. And luckily because I was young and able to kind of adapt quickly to all the social media changes that were happening, I was able to be a resource for them as well. So it was a very uh, synergistic uh, arrangement that happened with, with myself and a lot of people that I networked with back at the time. Right. You know, I add into that question, uh, you know, like you said, you know, like uh, you started your career when like social was new, Facebook was new. I mean, how, how have you seen like overall, you know, the entire social media space evolve over the years? Yeah, it's definitely evolved a lot and still is always changing. It's hard to keep up with sometimes. But I think definitely when I when I first began, Twitter was a lot more prevalent for, I would say, biz dev and and talking and communication than it is now. I feel like now it's a little bit more news oriented. People get their news there, but they don't necessarily go to Twitter to look for a restaurant, for example. Now we have some other channels like Instagram or Yelp, obviously, for, for searching for different businesses like that. Um, I remember at the time when social media was first again, starting for business, we would have, we called them tweet ups, which were literally people we met on Twitter, had been chatting on Twitter, and we'd go meet in, in person from having met through Twitter. So that was really exciting at the time. And, and that kind of stuff doesn't happen as much anymore, but Twitter certainly still is a great business tool for many companies, um, particularly with its integration of hashtags. Hashtags are, are much more popular on Twitter versus Facebook, for example. Um, Certainly LinkedIn for businesses and B2B brands is, is very relevant. It was also relevant back then, but I still kind of say Facebook and Twitter are still kind of the big two, but just depending on what kind of business you have, it might make sense to, to not be on Twitter and be on a more visual brand like Instagram or like Pinterest, for example, depending on what, what it is you're offering. So that's something I like to do with clients is look at, at their particular brand, their particular audience and see where their audience, I would say, look at where your audience is hanging out because that's where you want to be. So you don't necessarily need to be on every platform, but be on the ones that are most important to you and your business. Um, in terms of the evolution, I mean, there's so many different angles to, to talk about with this, certainly new, new platforms that come out regularly, like TikTok wasn't even around two years ago, and now it's a big one, especially for Gen Z. Um, and then for some of the platforms that have been around forever, like Facebook and Instagram and, and Twitter, they're always changing their algorithms or they're changing the way that they present things or like Twitter more recently updated their character count from 140 to 280 characters, for example. So there's a lot of little changes that happen on a regular basis that you kind of need to keep your finger on the pulse of to, to know what's going on when you're when you're using those mediums to market your business. 
Absolutely. And you know, like you talked about TikTok. I mean, you know, like you're also seeing now businesses actually hiring like young people just to make some TikTok videos on their mobile right. phones, right? I mean, yeah. it, it, it's cost saving, but at the same time, you know, it's an interesting um, evolution of social media as well. Totally. Yeah. I think you, you hit upon two topics there, one of which is TikTok marketing and the other is the influencer marketing phenomenon. And, you know, there's different, different ways to go about it. I think for TikTok, definitely it's geared toward a younger audience. Younger audiences use it. I don't think 40, 50, 60 year old people are looking for businesses on TikTok. So certainly again, tailoring to your audience and knowing where your audience is, is, is critically important. But if you do have a younger audience, it might be vital to be on TikTok and it might be worthwhile to spend that money on an influencer to get in front of your audience. And um, again, influencer, influencer marketing can be a tricky topic, but if it's if done right and done well, it can be valuable. One thing I've seen be beneficial for a lot of businesses that is might be called micro-influencers. So it's not necessarily a big celebrity because people can be a little um, mistrusting of big celebrities just because they know they have all these endorsements and all these brands that they're promoting and people know they're getting paid to do that. So it doesn't seem as authentic as perhaps another regular person who might have a big following that they've grown organically, but they have a more personal kind of vibe about them and they feel more relatable to people. So using those micro influencers, it can be beneficial. They're obviously a lot less expensive than the big celebrities as well. Um, but I've seen one, one good example is uh, Marriott hired this guy and uh, he was just a regular traveler that, that was loyal to Marriott hotels. And he started taking pictures of their carpet like the unique carpet patterns on different hotels. Yeah. And they ended up bringing him on board to do a whole campaign around their carpet. And it was just, it was something very unique. And it, he was, you know, an older man, not your typical, not the typical vibe you would think of when you think of an influencer, but it, it worked out really well and it created that win-win situation. So there are a lot of different ways to go about it if you find the right kind of people to, to be an influencer for your brand. No, absolutely. And, you know, like when you talk about micro influencers, uh, you know, uh, I just remembered, so, uh, we used to work uh, with a client, I mean, from Australia, he was into carpet cleaning, but the way he had actually, you know, developed his brand and become like one of the biggest, um, you know, he was also like uh, selling uh, accessories and stuff later, but you know, the reason he became a brand was what he had done. Uh, he kind of collaborated with somebody who used to give carpet cleaning uh, trainings basically. So what he did was he collaborated with him, basically made a lot of videos with him. And, you know, the USP would be that, you know, whoever kind of, you know, uh, worked with him, got the entire training and stuff. So not a big celebrity, but at the same time, uh, you know, somebody who actually a lot of people looked up to as far as training and, you know, improving their carpet cleaning business was concerned. And he just collaborated with him and, you know, ultimately grew his own brand. Yeah, that's a perfect example. Yeah, he's right. definitely relatable to, to more people. Perfect. Uh, also, Debbie, you know, like I said, uh, so, you know, the difference between, um, you know, Google and social, right? I mean, social media and like, you know, AdWords or SEO, like pure Google. Uh, a lot of people, like you said, you know, like even when you talk only about social media strategy, you said, you know, and you rightly said that, uh, you know, that the first most important thing is to understand where your audience is, right? Now, uh, when you talk about social, again, you know, every business has its audience on social media, right? I mean, yeah, you have to understand where exactly on social media it would make more sense. Like you said, you know, a 50, 60 year old person, uh, if he is your target audience, he will not be there on TikTok. But still, you know, somewhere on social media, you will find your audience. Now in Google, you know, when you're trying to do AdWords or you're trying to do, you know, SEO, you know, you're basically trying to rank on keywords where actually your user is searching for them or looking for a service, right? So it's, it's very direct. Now in social, you know, it is not necessary, you know, the person is actually searching uh, for that service or keyword, you know, you're just trying to get in front of your audience. So, you know, when people do social campaigns, I mean, what is the best strategy or is there a strategy where, you know, should you promote content as a trigger point and then nurture your audience? Or, you know, would you also suggest doing like direct lead gen campaigns on social as well? 
Yeah. So I think there's a couple, I have a couple different like tangents I can go off of it based on the various things you just said. One would be, I know this is kind of a, a cop-out answer, but it, it's, it depends on the brand. Um, so a lot of brands will use social for brand awareness more so than direct revenue generating campaigns, just because sometimes it's hard to correlate ROI to social. You know, you don't know that someone didn't go to your Facebook page and then go to your website and make a purchase, for example. You can't always correlate that if they come back a couple days later. Obviously, there's different tracking mechanisms you can employ to, to try to track as much as possible. But a lot of times people might again find you on Instagram and then remember and go see you later. There's a retargeting pain campaign, they'll find you again, and that's trackable. But there's a lot of ways in which social generated brand awareness isn't measurable, which is kind of a bummer. Um, but so on, on that regard, it's beneficial just to have a social presence because everyone expects you to, everyone's using those channels on a daily basis, even if they're not proactively shopping or looking for a service, they're always on those channels just to kind of kill time and mindlessly scroll. So you wanna be there for sure. It's great from brand awareness perspective, regardless of if you are proactively advertising or not. If you are proactively advertising and doing a lead gen campaign, for example, there are definitely a variety of tools that you can utilize to, to optimize that as much as possible. So Facebook's um, you know, ad business manager, their ad portal has a lot of great opportunities for targeting to your specific audience. They're targeting um, tools and and, avail and the elements they have available for, for targeting is great. It's kind of a Bummer for pri from a privacy standpoint. I know that's a hot topic of, okay. of, you know, Facebook knows so much about us, but the benefit for marketers is that Facebook knows so much about us. So if you're selling a specific product, you can target people who are interested in that product. You can target people who like similar pages to you, who, you know, if it's a certain age range or, you know, male versus female, all of those different, um, you know, ge not geo-targeting, but de demographic targeting data, Facebook has all that. And they're able to give you your exact audience. And that's awesome for a marketer. You, you want your warm leads. You want people who are going to actually engage with you or buy your product or service or whatever it may be. So that's highly beneficial. And Facebook and Instagram are integrated as well. So you can advertise to both platforms with a very targeted campaign that can be highly beneficial. And you can spend a relatively low amount of money to do that, which is also awesome. Um, you don't need a huge budget, whereas you might have needed a huge budget to do other, other marketing campaigns in the past. Um, and then to circle back to your kind of the original SEO elements of the conversation, certain social platforms are actually really good for SEO as well. So Pinterest is an example of that. I don't know if um, people aren't as familiar with Pinterest. It's kind of not one of the not as popular channels, but when you add a pin to Pinterest, you can add your website link, you can add a description and anyone searching for, for certain items in Pinterest, and a lot of people do, um, they'll find your pins and they click on your website. So I've seen Pinterest be a huge driver of traffic to websites and a huge um, SEO play that can be can be integrated with Pinterest. And similarly with YouTube, obviously we know YouTube is the second biggest search engine. So people are always looking for videos on certain topics. So making sure when you add YouTube videos, not only are you sharing those across your social networks, but you're also optimizing your video title and your video description and thinking about which keywords you can add in there because that'll help you rank higher in Google as well. So there's a lot of different plays and a lot of different ways that search and social are integrated and you can either use them either for brand campaigns or, or lead gen campaigns, depending on what you're, what you're going for. No, absolutely. And you know, like it's, it's very, uh, I mean, it's good for marketers, but you know, we, we recently did a test uh, in a social campaign, like, you know, with Facebook where we actually kept the targeting broad Right. Instead of, you know, actually, uh, you know, like narrowing it down um, and like within five days of, you know, again, you know, like initially we started getting conversions, you know, like uh, somewhere not relevant, somewhere irrelevant. But once the campaign actually started getting conversions, you know, in a very short span, like of time. And again, I'm not sure if you know this is an exact number, but, you know, the tests we have done. Once you start like kind of getting, let's say on an average, like one lead per day in Facebook, the algorithm itself, you know, works in such a way that actually you then start, you know, the algorithm understand where your actual audience is. I mean, relevant audience, you know, then with time, even the quality automatically starts increasing of the leads. So, you know, like Facebook knows so much that, you know, even if you're keeping it broad, again, you know, you can't just keep it broad. You have to specify your interests and stuff, but then still the algorithm is so smart that you ultimately start getting relevant leads with time. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. 
I don't do as much on the paid side. I do more of the organic social, but I, I've done some um, advertising campaigns and done some of that. And then lookalike audiences are another great, great option. That's where you can take an audience that you already have, such as an email list, for example, and then you can, can integrate that into to Facebook and they'll create a list of people who behave in the same way that your actual audience does. So again, it's kind of creepy from a privacy perspective, but from a marketing perspective, it's a goldmine because you have so many people, again, who fit your ideal customer mold and are you able to market to those people? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Debbie, you have spoken about uh, taking URL to IRL, uh, mm -hmm. taking you know online relationships to in real life. Uh, it would be great if you could elaborate on that here on our channel today. Yeah. Yeah. So that's something I've run into a lot with clients, especially in the hospitality industry, for example, where they have perhaps a really, you know, a loyal, a loyal fan base or loyal customers that have, for example, Marriott, you know, people who've been going to them for years, who will always go to a Marriott hotel, um, who, who will be loyal to the brand in person, who will always frequent that specific brand. And then you have an audience online who perhaps found a Facebook page or an Instagram page and they like you and follow you, but they've never set foot inside a Marriott hotel. And it's the practice and, and the strategy of bridging that gap of how do you get your in-person audience and loyal brand advocates to advocate for you online. So how do you get, you know, Mr. Brand Ambassador who's walking into your Marriott hotel all the time, how do you get them to post about you and talk about you to their friends and kind of become a, an authentic micro-influencer type person? Um, and then similarly, how do you get that online audience in the door? So it's it's kind of, it goes both ways on that in that regard, but it's a tricky situation. And it's something, especially again in hospitality that that happens a lot where you have that disjointed, you have those two separate audiences and you want to get them both to each to become the other and um, and get more, you want to grow the audience that's, that's, you know, being in both areas that's advocating for you online. And that's actually spending money with you, setting foot in the door of your venue. Um, so, you know, there are different ways to do that. There are a lot, a lot of businesses now and actually COVID um, created a lot of ways with QR codes to make it easy for people to pull up a business right on their phone yeah. and, and yeah. you know, go and like the page on Facebook or Instagram or whatever, but um, certainly, you know, in-person signage that promotes, you know, take a picture and uh, a lot of restaurants will, will say, you know, take a picture, post, you know, tag check in while you're here. And we'll give you a free appetizer, for example, you know, figure out ways to get the the on-site people to be posting. And then similarly offering the people who might follow you on the fan page, give them an incentive to come in the door. So perhaps it's, oh, show this, you know, coupon code when you come in for a free appetizer, for example, to the people that are online. So it's figuring out ways to to get those those two audiences to become the same, you know, to become advocates on both both IRL and online. Right. So tricky. Right. You know, also, like, you know, I think with now, you know, because of COVID, again, you know, like, uh, the vaccine is there, and, you know, uh, hopefully things are becoming better. Uh, but, you know, also, I think one thing that happened because of COVID is, you know, everybody was online, right? I mean, which is good. Yeah, I mean, you know, everybody's online for marketers. But then also, I believe, you know, the competition to actually create a viral content or engaging content increased because everybody is now, you know, putting content on online, right? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, how, how do you see that, you know, like impacting or, you know, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, it's, it's a really interesting phenomenon. I think uh, QR codes especially are, are one, one thing that I think is going to uh, continue to resonate in the future, even past COVID, now that people are used to it. And I think people are a little more tuned in to um, the kind of content that's out there. And the trick for marketers is you have to figure out how to stand out amongst the noise because there's so much content online now. And how do you differentiate yourself from your competitors? And how do you put out content that resonates with your audience and that stands out and that is authentic? And um, it's a tricky it's a tricky balance. And it's something that you have to try to figure out. Again, it's a different brand by brand, uh, di different strategies involved. but um, kind of goes back to the core elements we talked about at the beginning of, of knowing where your audience is, being where they are, um, you know, paying attention to your audience needs, your, your buyer, you know, looking at buyer personas and, and where they're hanging out and what they're doing and monitoring all those things and monitoring what your audience is saying about you, not only your own content that you're putting out, but content that's being said about you putting, being put out there by others, which is another phenomenon that's new in the social media spaces that you have all these people talking about you and you can't always control the message. And sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad. And, making sure you're on top of all that that noise that's out there about your your company as well is important that's kind of more on the, the reputation management side of things but 
but monitoring all that and just keeping tabs on everything that's out there and controlling it as much as possible and making sure that it's authentic and unique and and different from what everyone else is saying as well right right i mean wh what are your uh, you know like suggestions on how to handle like you know like you said you know some people will talk good some people will talk bad i mean how do you particularly respond to negative comments on social yeah, no, that's a great question. There's there are a lot of different ways to, to do it, and it depends on the circumstances as well. Um, but certainly, there's usually some sort of brand document with with some responses for different scenarios. I actually had a client uh, was doing community management for a grocery store at the beginning of COVID, and that was uh, an experience to <laughs> to be remembered. And certainly, like people were just up on all sides of every issue. You know, I hate masks. I love masks. I, you know, it's every every side of everything. People are just upset and they're heated and. Um, you know, we had responses, you know, for everything that we had to kind of map out. And then, of course, there are, there are tweaks that need to be made based on the specific situation. But one rule of thumb that I've always done um, in general with, with negative comments, which of course come up and they're often justified to some degree, is to respond publicly, but then take it offline. So um, if someone complains about something, you know, say, you know, we apologize for the situation, you know, so-and-so, uh, please send us a, a private message so we can explore this further. Or please, you know, DM us your contact information so we can follow up with you or so our team can follow up with you and that shows publicly that you're addressing the issue and not skirting around it but then it allows you to take the conversation offline and resolve the issue without you know airing the dirty laundry on a public <laughs> public forum so that's kind of the, the general rule of thumb would be respond publicly and then take it private so you can wrap it all up nicely right. absolutely also i mean what according to you you know like are the best practices for using social proof in your marketing strategy yeah, so social proof, I think, has become critically important. And it kind of ties into the influencer conversation as well as using social proof to show that um, not only are you as a brand uh, pr you know, promoting these things, which is the traditional way of marketing brands would be promoting themselves. Now that you have all these advocates that you can have advocating for you on social and talking about you on social and using your product or service on social, it allows you that extra layer of, um, what's the word? Like, not authenticity, but just an extra layer of... Um, Oh shoot, I can't think of the word. It might be authenticity is the closest thing I can think of. It just, it shows that people are in fact uh, using or believing and utilizing and trusting the brand message that you're putting out. You know, it shows that you're not just spewing this stuff to be an advertiser to market yourself, but it, it adds a layer of um, like truth, truth and honesty to, to what you offer by having social media users showing that this is true, this is real, this is a great experience, this venue is awesome. Like um, there's different ways to, to go about doing that. One, one example that comes to mind, this is kind of a sad example, but um, Vanessa Bryant took Kobe Bryant's wife who I, I follow on Instagram. She just launched their, the new sweatshirts for the Mama Mamacita Sports Foundation. And so she sent the sweatshirts out to a bunch of celebrities and sports stars. And, um, and then everyone was talking about that campaign and to raise money for that organization. And that was a perfect example of social proof. It's showing that every, you know, here's all these important people that are supporting this mission that um, are wearing these clothes. And, and that was a great example, I thought, and a you know, very touching um, situation with, with them. But um, it was something that was really, really profoundly impactful to see like all these, all these people get on board. And the other thing that's cool about it, and that was obviously a bigger example where there's like legitimate celebrities and stars involved, but it's cool to see so many different kinds of people from so many different, different places that were supporting this single mission. I think there's a unifying aspect to that that feels really lovely especially kind of in the current world where everything's very very uh, right. confrontational <laughs> absolutely absolutely also debbie you know like uh you know we talked about twitter and you know like you said you know like hashtags on twitter uh you know add more value and make more sense now you know again you know hashtag is a very tricky concept because you know you have limited number of words and stuff like that so i mean what you know what are the best practices you know, for using hashtag or, you know, in simple words, like, you know, what makes a good hashtag? Yeah, this is, a, this is kind of a tricky topic because on the one hand, you do want to use hashtags and be, you know, expand your reach in that way. And then on the other hand, it can come across as spammy. Um, 
um, if you use broad hashtags all the time, people probably aren't going to see them because the, the bigger brands that use those hashtags are probably going to be more viewable than you are. Um, so it's kind of, you kind of have to find the middle ground there. Um, Instagram is definitely a platform where hashtags are relevant. People search for hashtags. My clients usually will use hashtags on Instagram, but not as much on Facebook, for example, because people don't usually use Facebook as much for hashtag searching. I have seen on Twitter, hashtags are still very popular as well. And they, they obviously always show their tw tw trending Twitter uh, hashtag. So certainly on Twitter and Instagram, hashtags are still pretty relevant. I think just finding the ones that are relevant, but not where you're not going to get buried um, in the other, in the other hashtags. And then also finding the right amount to make sure you're not going to get shadow banned. I don't know if you've heard of shadow banning, but um, that's where Instagram will block you. If they feel like you're abusing hashtags, that will make you not show up for those searches anymore. So that's something to keep an eye on. And then I know around the election as well, they actually stopped showing, or I mean, you could still add hashtags to your posts, but they basically kind of turned off Twitter, or I'm sorry, turned off, um, hashtags on Instagram because there was too much misinformation being spread. Right. Um, that was something that, that obviously, you know, I had clients that were like, why is no one seeing my posts anymore with all these hashtags? And like, it's cause they're, they're not, you know, they're not showing the same way they did before. Um, and that was definitely a noticeable shift when that occurred. So, um, yeah, just finding the right ones, trying to find ones. It's kind of a short versus long tail keyword uh, problem in SEO as well, where you can go broad, um, for example, if you're a hotel, it's doing hashtag hotel, but there's also a million, million people in hotels using hashtag hotel. You're never going to get to the top of that feed. Like there's no way. But if you use something like, oh, Los Angeles hotel, for example, or something specific like that, you're more likely to ring, you know, show up for that, but there's not as many people searching for it. So it's like catch 22 on what works best. Right. Absolutely. Also, you know, today a successful social media strategy, you know, requires community building to be successful. How do you think businesses can do that? Yeah, so it's kind of a, a tricky thing. So I think one component is obviously making sure that you're responding to comments, monitoring, responding to comments, um, and making sure that everything, if you if you do like reporting, make sure you're tagging comments appropriately to keep track of everything that's coming in. Um, again, doing a lot monthly reporting and analysis or more often than that sometimes it is important because then you, again, you can see what's working, what's not working. You might see that certain channels are doing great. Others are not doing well at all. You don't need to spend time there, for example. Um, and then from a community building perspective, I like to try to find like for Twitter, or Instagram, for example, I'll go follow other relevant accounts to the, to that brand or other relevant influencers in the space or other, you know, accounts and then comment on other accounts as well. And then the idea is that those folks will hopefully follow you back and comment back to you. And it's kind of a circular relationship building exercise, but um, that's a little more manual, but it, it does, it works pretty well. And it allows you again to have targeted accounts versus having like a bunch of bots or something follow your account, which you can drive up the numbers, but there's not going to be any ROI from that because they're never going to engage with you or buy your products. So not, <laughs> don't buy followers. Is the, is the point there. Right. No, absolutely. I mean, you know, and I think even now, you know, I mean, I was doing a research uh, last week where, uh, you know, the number of, uh, you know, it's, it's a very simple thing, but, you know, it kind of caught my eye where, you know, even the number of accounts, like social accounts being sold has increased, right? I mean, you know, there's a proper marketplace where, you know, people are actually selling like, you know, like an old, um, particular pro you know persona linkedin profile you know a particular persona facebook profile i mean even that has increased so much and has become so popular interesting i didn't realize that i used to i used to, sometimes we'd inherit inherit clients that had bought like twitter followers or something and you could tell they were just all spam it was just all real spammy and i mean like these people are never gonna again they're never gonna spend money on you they're never gonna engage there's no point in that but some people, for whatever reason, for if you want to just inflate the numbers, that's the way to do it. But there's not going to be any real ROI there. No, but no, I, I mean, I yeah. hadn't heard about the though. That's interesting. No, no, absolutely. So you know, like it's something called as social manipulation, where people are using it. So you know, let's say uh, my target audience. Let's say I am a roofing contractor. Then you know, I will buy certain profiles that already have those type of connections, and then you know. Uh, make them join groups and then these people you know start answering communicating and ultimately they basically are uh, you know manipulating and uh, pitching uh, this particular person in these profiles and stuff and it's working for a lot of people 
Interesting. I definitely get a lot of spammy messages on LinkedIn of people trying to sell me services and stuff. So I, now I'm going to start noting that that's a, <laughs> a manipulation. Yeah. Well, Debbie, I know we are short on time, uh, you know, but before uh, you go today, uh, you know, like, you know, somebody handling social media, you know, I mean, again, a lot of things need automation, you know, like scheduling tool and stuff like that. So what are like, you know, your favorite tools uh, that, you know, you use or you, you suggest like any social media marketer to have? Yeah, that's a good question. So there are a bunch of different ones and they all do similar things. So it kind of depends on the scope of your, um, I would say the scope of your community management needs as well. Like I mentioned the grocery store, they obviously had needed a lot of community, ma community management and they need a big platform that's going to manage all that, the, the, the amount of content that comes in for them. Whereas a smaller client might not need as much of that. So um, for larger clients, Sprinkler is great. Uh, social studio is great. I have another client, another lar larger client that's on social studio for community management purposes. And then for scheduling content, you can go a little more simple for like Hootsuite or Buffer or great two basic ones for scheduling. Agora Pulse is another great one for scheduling and they have great reporting as well. Um, I would say those are the, the main ones probably. Sprout Social is also great for both scheduling and monitoring. Um, yeah. Are, I think those are probably the, the primary ones that, that I've used. Right. Well, thank you so much for your time. It was lovely chatting with you. And hopefully, okay. you know, we'll, we'll catch up again uh, sometime soon, you know, uh, with a new topic. Sounds good. That'd be great.